Welcome back to the Story Archives podcast. Do we have a name for this pod yet, Zach? Is it the Peaky Pod? I think we should nickname it the Peaky Pod, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm your host, Mario Busto, and I'm here with Zachary Newton. Zach, what's up? Hey, man? how is it going? It's uh, it's early on a Tuesday. So it's going. Not that early. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> I got I got a like half cup of coffee in me right now, and uh, we're good to go. It's not as fun as doing the night pods with the oh, whiskey, yeah. um, but you know maybe what can maybe you do? We can make that a Thursday thing or something. Well, I don't know what's in your cup, so you might be doing the whiskey oh, one at the I'm moment. Just drinking tea. I'm out of beans for my coffee. Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> All right, we are we are on episode two season one of Peaky Blinders and um, picking up where we left off from the last episode and um, we're going through a whole series as you as we talked about in episode one we're doing a full watch through before season six comes oh, out yeah. in to be determined 2022 I think it's going to be early 2022 as they usually have launched I think in the past they've usually done early 2022 And um, we're trying to run through the series before that happens. See if we can do it. All right. So, picking up episode two. Let's get into the episode recap. Let's do it. All right. We start the episode with a couple of introductions. An introduction to a rival gang Mm -hmm. called the Lee Boys. Uh, Tommy's on his way with uh, John Boy and um, Arthur Arthur to... um, to essentially flip a coin for a horse in exchange for uh, for their family car. <laughs> Does the whole series go a different way? Like if they lose this toss, like well, you know, you think you know about he's it. not betting the car, right? It was just a ride in the car, isn't that what he said? No, that was not it. No, he said he said if they uh, if he if he lost, he gave him a ride in the car. But in reality, it was that he would get the car. But Tommy probably cheated in some way. Oh, like, you know, we know I Tommy. I wouldn't He's put it gonna... past him, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no I way. I like the opening shot in this, though. It's just quiet. You get this, this nice old car coming towards you. Yeah, I got an appreciation for the English countryside. Same. If that was shot in the English countryside. Wherever it was shot. Looks great. Yeah. And I love the car. Uh, yeah. A lot of horses in this episode. Like, a lot of horse talk. Yeah. There is. There's a bit of, there's a bit of horse talk. Anyways, the boys go out and they make a trip to the countryside. I didn't even notice the gypsy fair on the top. If you notice that shot. Oh, yeah. If you look at the top of the yeah. hill. I didn't notice that either, honestly. I didn't what notice it. I'm uh, sure a lot of people didn't notice that. It's, a, it's like a gypsy fair. What the heck? Yeah, yeah, that, definitely like a gypsy fair. And um, they go and they, they win a, a horse, this beautiful white horse mm-hmm. from the Lee boys. But really, it's it's a kind of like troubling territory because tommy goes and he doesn't shy away from a fight as the lee boys no. clearly wanted to to get into something with them by making fun of his oh, mother but sure. seems to be a soft spot for tommy shelby right yeah yeah called his mom a diddy koi whore i mean i think we should bring diddy koi diddy koi <laughs> <laughs> diddy koi whore back as like a as a as an insult it's pretty pretty good yeah. but um uh, we see here the first glimpse of the peaky, the peaky caps, mm-hmm. man. The peaky blinders. You see the peaky blinders literally in action. Yeah, I was gonna say we saw the we saw the actual cap with the blade in it in the last episode. But this is the first time we really get to see it being used, it which used, is yeah. uh, pretty interesting. A little, uh, you got to be precise to, to strike someone across the eye with that hat. Right, we well, gotta get up close. You gotta, right? well, you gotta, you gotta get, get up, up close, close, but you gotta be, you gotta be precise, like to get well, him in I'm the assuming eye. it's weighted a bit. It can't just be like a floppy little razor blade. It has to be weighted. So, did you notice the uh, the comment by Johnny Dogs about the uh, about their granddad being royalty, essentially being like a king? No, I don't think so. Did you watch the episode? Of course, I watched the episode. Oh wait, yeah, I do remember that. He's a king. When the Lee, when the Lee boys yeah. when the Lee boys are making fun of them, they're like, "Hey, their granddad was royalty." So I'm assuming their granddad was like some sort of gypsy king of I'd some imagine. sort. Um, but anyways, these these Lee boys are the most unprepared bullies I've ever seen for a fight. <laughs> I mean, they literally start the fight and they get destroyed. 
not gonna lie, this scene reminded me of uh, of Good Will Hunting when they actually start fighting and it's like in slow motion, uh-huh. and uh, they're on the basketball court in Good Will Hunting. It's like a very slow motion fight scene, and to me, I always see it kind of like these shots. The reason they're slow and shot like this is because it's like very indie. Yeah, in a way, very indie. I don't know. It just well, let me listen like, to you the don't music have to do too. much. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to do much. It's like very low angle, so there's only like ever like one or two people in frame. Mm-hmm. Like you notice everything's like there may have been like, like ten yeah. strikes in this entire yeah shot. maybe yeah John Boy is just but a, a very a very stylish wild. beating you know oh, very great they music should make too. this into like a fashion campaign like <laughs> Ralph at the end is Ralph Lauren. oh man yeah all right meanwhile while the Shelby boys are getting into fights with the Lee boys and starting a war. Uh, you got Campbell being, you know, C- Campbell's a sneaky kind of coward in mm-hmm. a way. Like he has the raid while the boys are out, but it's not really cowardly. It's kind of smart. Let's go and do the raid while, while the bosses are gone. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so he has this whole Belfast crew rolling through all of the, it looks like the slums to me. I'll be honest with you. It's just like these working class homes, yeah. I guess. They're not slums necessarily because they don't look they're actually pretty decent construction. Yeah, I mean it looks but, it looks good. It's just dark and dirty. But it looks it looks depressing. It doesn't actually look dirty if you look at those well, sidewalks. I mean, sidewalks like, kind of they look cleaner than my it's sidewalk. Like black, they're like there's just dirt, yeah, dust, just black. grime all over the all over the ground. It's clean in the sense that there's not just trash everywhere. But it, it's so it's like a depressing. Oh, area. Here we have Ada. And a- Ada's getting it on with Freddie in the midst of this raid. Uh-huh. You know, Ada. You know, I'm not going to make any comments. <laughs> I'm not going to make any comments about Ada. But uh, Freddie and her make an escape from the raid, you mm-hmm. know, as everyone's getting their ass beat in they the really streets are. here. They really these, are. These police are brutal in this one. Yeah. Well, they're, they're not, not. Like, as we see in the last episode, it's like Campbell's technically the good guy, right? But he's not. The guy is... No, he's, he's he really has his own. He has his own agenda. He has his own goals of probably power and ascending through the ranks of whatever the Justice Department oh, and sure. whatever he does. For sure. And um, he's going to do whatever it takes to find the weapons because it's going to ruin his career if he doesn't. So I find it odd that she has a prescription for iron there. Like, why would you leave a prescription at Freddy's? Why would you why leave would, a prescription why would, why at would Freddy's? Why would you have a prescription at Freddy's? Because she's sleeping over. She has a purse and she left it there and fell out of her purse. She's probably been telling Freddie, I feel sick lately. I need something. And she's like, and he's probably like, oh, it's just probably an iron deficiency. Yeah. Definitely not a baby. <laughs> Definitely not a baby inside you. Um, you know, this on the rewatch of this, um, the scene where Campbell goes into the church, I never noticed like how rude he is to church tradition uh-huh. in, in there. I mean, he keeps his cap on. He even does even something worse. Like he empties his tobacco on the, pipe on the floor of the church. Well, he emptied it on which, the pew. He, he's, well, he's tapping it against the pew, and then it is all over the floor. Which is kind of you know it shows that he doesn't have any no respect uh, reverence yeah. any reverence for anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're disrespectful in a church, I would have to say you, you're going to be disrespectful anywhere. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think it's just the cap and the pipe. It's a holy, it's a holy place, regardless of your belief. It's a it's a place of worship, sure. you know. I think the cap and the 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 uh, piper are extremely small details here. And look at just the way that he treats Polly. <laughs> mm-hmm. I lo- yeah, I he... love her response though. Whoa, whoops, well, she's I baiting mis- him, right? She's she... you're uh, pushing me up against the yeah, wall. Yeah, <laughs> she's she's baiting him in this scene, right? She knows that it's a soft spot for this guy that he didn't serve mm-hmm. in the in the war, and so they're using this as like a really key bait for him and. Um, she calls him out essentially for being a coward and saying he wouldn't have done the raid if, if the Shelby boys were mm-hmm. there. Um, but he's not there to really converse too much with Polly. He's there to continue the raid, and so they turn the church upside down and in the in the attempt to look for guns. I'm not gonna lie, I probably would have checked the church too for the guns. Yeah, it's the place that like it's a decent hiding spot for something no, it, that you don't want. Found. I would definitely check it as well, but there's, there's a way to check it. That is just visually less violent to everything that exists in the church. <laughs> yeah. True, <laughs> like, true. I feel like I don't they come know in if and they, just like, it looks like they're about to wreck the place. Yeah. It looks like they're about to like ransack everything. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, he says, turn the place upside down. Yeah. Turn the place upside down. The baby's in the eggshells. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I still say it with all the crap that's talked about Campbell here, he's smart to do the raid the way he did it. Yeah. Um, he even left, a, you know, as Paulie says in the next scene, you know, where the boys meet up with Paulie in the bar, uh, the guys are coming back and they're seeing, like, you know, what the hell happened here while we were mm-hmm. gone. And Paulie lets him know, like, hey, you know, they raided the whole place. But they also did it in such a way that it ma- they made it look like you guys were in on it because they didn't touch the garrison. Yeah. I never picked that up on previous rewatches of Peaky, that the way they did the raid was to like kind of knock down their street cred a bit. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, we pay you for protection and you're in on these things, you know? Yeah. So Paulie instructs them, you know, hey, you got to get back out there and start buying your credibility back. Start giving some people some money, pay for the repairs, and they start getting in motion for, to roll out that plan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, in the, I, I left out the fact that Campbell has already at this point acknowledged that Tom, uh, Tommy is the leader of the Peaky Blinders. Cause after the church raid, he tells, I want to see Thomas for tea. Yeah. I'm talking about the leader, you know? So he's, he, at this point knows it's Thomas. Uh, and it's funny cause you kind of get like two moments of that in this episode and mm-hmm. this scene and Billy Kimber, I like the way yes. Billy does it the best cause it's the best summary of all three brothers, period. <laughs> It's like, oh, so you're <laughs> oldest, you're thickest, you're the, you're, you're the thickest. <laughs> you must be, you Tom. must be the leader, because you're looking me up and down like a top. Uh-huh. It's great. <laughs> That's such a great. <laughs> Billy Kimber does a great job in this episode. So good. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Tommy refuses to meet back with uh, Campbell, and he gets this a great line. He says, "You don't parley when you're on the back foot." Mm-hmm. So he has to strike back, and he devises this plan to have essentially uh, um, a bonfire where they're burning pictures of the king. He brings a reporter to the scene, and um, it turns into a whole criminal PR stunt where Campbell's getting this late call because Tommy's pretty much leveraging his gallantry medals Mm -hmm. in, uh, in the war. And he's just leveraging that to like for the newspaper. It sounds exactly. great. Gallantry medal winner Tommy Shelby, mm-hmm. you know, is upset that uh, Belfast cops, people from out of the country who didn't fight for the country, uh, these are people who fought for their king. He's using everything in his favor. It's kind of, it's honestly kind of true mm-hmm. in some ways, but uh, he's brilliant here. Brings the reporter in, and Campbell gets the midnight call from your favorite character, Winston <sighs> Churchill. It, it, he is just so bad in this. It, it's just i don't i don't really like, this is even worse at first than i thought first that but i don't for me you think I so i haven't seen enough of winston churchill to like make an assessment of whether he's bad or not here here's the thing that oh I, if he was playing older winston churchill i'd be like what's going on but well, he, this is churchill like what you know 15 years before we get to like really get to yeah you know but him? i mean come on you're, you're already aging it fair amount by that anyways but is a thing that I can't stand about this Winston Churchill is this guy just feels like he's trying to force the character. Like he's, tr- it sounds like he's trying to force the accent. It just doesn't f- come out naturally. Yeah. I don't, um, I'd have to go back and listen to Churchill tapes. He definitely doesn't sound like older Churchill and he doesn't look like Churchill mm-hmm. to me. No, I'm you saying know, maybe the, the, the Churchill he cast it originally was, was, Churchill was, was wasn't able to make it best winston churchill yeah. i've seen the glasses are pretty good though yeah you notice like, like the Franklin the way glasses. they're shooting it here the way they're shooting it is like forehead down mm-hmm. right and the scenes where he's talking almost to kind of like hide the fact that he has yeah. hair because we know like the bald winston churchill yeah you know although it, it um, does kind of look like this guy's balding a bit it's long in the back but yeah it's like it's not far-fetched to say yeah. that he will look like churchill i mean churchill supposedly like drank like a like an animal and smoke like i don't know how many cigars a day so would it be that crazy to to age like faster than the average person? No, it's not I so much. It. Anyways, actually about the call here, he's furious about the the PR going on there. He's not necessarily like angry, but he's just like, Campbell, we need results. I don't want to hear progress. We need results. So Tommy's a- attempt was successful in uh, putting the pressure on Campbell, mm-hmm. so that when he gets to when he actually goes and meets with him, it's um. There's more of an equal footing here on their on their negotiation. You don't want to go into a negotiation on the on the back foot, as he says. No. No. I like um, I like how Polly just knows Ada is pregnant here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand yeah. up. 
grabs your remember head. remember the nobody's watching this with us so just always paint that picture with them but she just knows she grabs you by the boob and she's like mm-hmm. yep ada how late are you polly's a witch i wrote that in my notes here like she's just she she does this in several points throughout oh, the yeah. of the series where she just knows something's going on and there, we see a couple gypsy moments in, in this episode. Yeah, Maybe this is like this, the, gyps, the gypsy episode. I got episode more of a vibe because of the it starts, gypsy thing in this one for sure. Yeah, because this starts with the gypsies and then you have this situation and then you have what happens later with the horse, mm-hmm. which escalated very quickly with the horse. Yeah. But anyway, long story short, uh, Polly turns out, it, she finds out that Ada is pregnant or she guesses that she's mm-hmm. pregnant. And uh, I think, it, you know, the first telltale sign is she's eating this bread that needed to be a little bit toasted. Yeah. And she's just, like, shoveling this thing down and um, just didn't look that appetizing. No. But she's pregnant, so she had, like, this craving for something. Mm-hmm. So, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm just kidding. That wasn't actually in my notes, but the bread did need to be it toasted. Needed, she it needed something. It had scene. a lot of jelly on it, but it needed something else. No, I needed, the jelly's fine, but, like, the, the jelly to bread po- proportion was completely <laughs> off. It was, like, on the just the tip of the bread. <laughs> It wasn't spreading right. There was, I mean, I understand there weren't toasters back then, but actually, I think there were toasters back then. Not that they could afford them, but there were definitely toasters oh, back then. I mean, then. you could toast it. When toast was the toaster the invented? Or something, I'm sure. This, uh, I'm assuming Polly took her to like 1890s. A, a gynecologist. That is, is, that place is dirty, man. <laughs> ba- a backdoor gynecologist. Oh, my yeah, gosh. it's. Uh, I thought that was the abortion clinic when they when they first got there because it just looked so. Uh, like, uh, what's the Dirty, word? Like, uh, dingy, dark. Dingy, yeah. dingy is the word I was looking for. But dude, this is, I mean, early 1900s industrial. Oh, I know. Era, England. What are you expecting? You know, John Hopkins. Like, it's not gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> you get a the next scene. You have a confrontation between uh, Tommy and Charlie, mm-hmm. and um, Charlie's confronting Tommy because there's war from all sides. The Lees declared war. And really, the pressure's coming down from all sides. The government's looking for those guns that Tommy has. Mm-hmm. Charlie's one of the few ones who knows about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Campbell's on their tail. Uh, the, like I said, the Lees declared war by sending a bullet with Tommy's name on it. And you got Billy Kimber, who's a ticky ti- ticking time bomb here with the with the fixed races. What do you What do you think of like all the at this point, like the escalation of conflict? I th- I think uh, Tommy's a bit in on. over his head. And again, keeping in mind, this is this is fresh after the war, like not even a year. So I think he's just so used to, you know, there being conflict that he's not even thinking about it. Yeah, you know, you get the sense of this is someone who's impatient. He's, you know, seen he's seen death up close, mm-hmm. and he's really when you see death that close and you survive, and you you have people around you you love that died. I'm a, it does something to you, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm assuming you kind of live like with this. Is he, Tommy's almost playing like Russian roulette in a way, yeah. right? Like these are these are all like all in gambles that he's in on this, mm-hmm. right? He could easily he could be killed by the Lees, he could be killed by Billy Kimber, he could be killed by the government. Like all of these are like, you know, dead or alive type all in gambles. Like you stand to gain a lot, and he's risking the most, right? Yeah, I agree. A lot of them, though, you you could be like, all right, what do they have to live for? Honestly, like everybody they know has died. They've been through such crap. Well, they got they, they got plenty to live for, right? I mean, but you also have you understand now with that kind of mentality that he might have, why he's so mad about Ada being pregnant, mm-hmm. right? Because you know Polly's trying to get her to get a divorce, uh, not a divorce, an abortion, and um, Tommy's in the same boat because what he sees is. That Freddie Thorne is, um, he sees them as an opportunity to kind of like be the the tinder mm-hmm. for their for his communist revolution. Mm-hmm. In the next scene after the Charlie confrontation, you have Grace kind of like being an opportunist and uh, getting a confrontation with Tommy in which she demands one night a week of singing. And uh, Tommy invites her to the races before riding away on his white horse. Again, so you get like a little bit of a a love confrontation between these two again. A little bit, yeah, but she definitely has her angle here. I still want to know what on earth is in that slop bucket. <laughs> that looked like vomit. I know. 
if that would have gotten on Tommy, the whole series goes a different oh, route. Yeah, he would have killed Grace. There's just all of this stuff would have happened. <laughs> nah, he wouldn't have killed. Shot the horse. He wouldn't have killed. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the thing with Peaky is that, and we were talking about this before the the show. Zach just watched the Joker for the first yeah. time, and um, I was telling him I'm not like a big fan of the Joker, and I watch a lot of shows like with the antihero type uh, main characters. You know, I'm watching Sopranos right now. Mm-hmm. You know, Peaky Blinders has an anti-hero in Tommy Shelby, and everyone there is pretty much like a not the not your it's an atypical hero type. But the thing about Tommy Shelby is he's got redeeming factors yeah. to him. You know, like here you see him. You know, he you can see the moments of humanity shine through his mm-hmm. eyes. You know, like when he's talking to Grace, invites her to the race. He does good things for people. He doesn't only just do downright like deranged shit the whole time and the joker is just like this deranged guy who has been beaten down by society and like the whole movie is is a down note there Mm -hmm. is no single change in tone the whole movie and to me just like as a viewing experience it's not enjoyable to have like it's like just one you you put your finger on the end of a piano and just hold it down man just (laughs) hold it down because that's what that's what the joker felt like you know and it's also like not somebody who's a it's all these villain mo- origin movies have the same issue. They they always try to. This was, I think, the first one that finally owned it and said that, you know, this is a villain. where There is nothing that's going to be redeeming here in, in this mm-hmm. story. Because even with Suicide Squad, what they had to do is they had to have these villains. One of them had to have some sort of redeeming quality. Yeah. So you had, like, Idris Elba was, like, the, the you know, the better of the group along with the, the rat girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot her name. Uh that they have like at least some sort of redeeming quality to them. That's what the Joker doesn't have. That's what you know Peaky Blinders has and Breaking Bad and yeah, Sopranos. They, they do, but you know, you know those are. I mean, these are all TV shows where it, it's it's kind of going on. Long. No, come on that that Joker film, even if it was like a TV show, if it was at in that same note, I wouldn't want to see the Joker. In a TV show, my, my, a TV my point show? is you'd be sick of it well, after that's, that's two my episodes. Point. These are these are TV shows, and so you you have to Maybe have something episodes. redeeming to want to keep watching them over and over and over again and, and get into all of these situations. But I kind of liked the Joker movie because it because it was just so like monotone. It was just that one one you know note the whole time. Where I mean, look, he's a villain. That's the whole point of it. He's a villain. I like that. It's it's just different. Like. Every single movie you see, it's always all right. It's all, the good guy always has to win. All you know, of this crap. I've you know been what dying I, for a movie where the good guy does not win at the end. You know what's a little concerning? You know the good guy does not always win in everything. I don't know. Maybe you haven't watched enough Just the stuff, but the good guy doesn't always. They usually win, but there's a ton of stuff where the good guy doesn't win, or if that it's one of those endings that doesn't. Uh, that it's not a happy ending. It's a. It's. It's like a bittersweet ending, or it's a, or you know, it's a bitter ending. You know, it's tons of tons of movies like that. But uh, at least with characters that go down the path of becoming like a sociopath or like an evil villain, mm-hmm. they go through the humanity side before then. The Joker's just off beat the whole time. He's oh, he's just he's literally insane. In well, the he movie. is. And so, like, even when, if you notice, like, when he's in the in the comedy club and he's, when he's laughing, no one's mm-hmm. laughing. When every, other people are laughing, he's not laughing. Mm-hmm. The guy is just completely on the opposite side of society. Exactly. But then there's, like, this, also this moral of the story they were going for that I was, like, just not jiving with. I was, like, I'm not with this. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. It was, like, a, I don't, it was such a, I think it was also the time it released. There was a lot of, like, mass shootings going on. Yeah. You watched it at a different time. Or, I just watched it two days ago. Yeah, you saw it now, but I saw it when it came out, and I was like, damn. Especially that scene where he, like, spoiler alert, I'll give you five seconds to leave. All right, you're gone? Okay. When he stabs those people in the neck, like, with the scissor, that was like, Jesus, okay, those man, people, it was, it was so one dark. Person, and it was, it was a person who was only there because oh, he that's only right. he lets about the, his, he lets the he lets the the dwarf yeah, leave, exactly. right? Exactly, because the dwarf was there because he was his friend. He bought him a bottle. He's like, "Hey, I heard about your mom," or, and 
the other guy, well, I guess the he does other have guy a came along thing. and he's like, hey, I heard the cops are talking to you. I need to know what you said. Did you rat me out? Like he didn't, he didn't give a crap about, about, uh, I can't even remember his name from the movie, but the Joker. Exactly. Um, I didn't even know his name. It's, Arthur, yeah, Fleck. Arthur Fleck. Thank you. Um, yeah, he just didn't even care about him. So like, I like, is it the right decision? No, but he's a villain, so I get it. But yeah, it was brutal. That yeah, was like was. when the movie took like a the the, the final turn in a way. <laughs> back um, to Peaky. <laughs> all right, back back to Peaky here. Uh, Tommy finds out that Ada's pregnant. And Ada finally admits that it's Freddy, mm-hmm. um, who apparently was Tommy's best friend from like grade from school, school. She said, "I think." So why Tommy's so upset here? I don't under I don't know. you know fully understand. I think w- the reason is because he. It's not just about the communist revolution. It's about other things too. I think it's like maybe that Freddy's always going to be a reminder of of who he used to be. You know, maybe Freddy's always a reminder of of the. Because remember, Paulie here at some point when he burns the letter, mm-hmm. there's a scene here where um, Tommy meets with Polly. I think it's actually right here. Yeah. Uh, it. Where it's after the Ada confrontation where he's talking to Polly and she gives him a letter and says, This is Ada wrote it for Freddie to give him a chance. Mm-hmm. And Tommy throws it in the fire. Um, essentially. I think, you know, maybe here it's one of those things where Tommy doesn't need any distractions in the, on the path that he's mm-hmm. on right now. He already has four different fronts of war he's on. He just, in this scene, he's succeeded in one of them or in one part of them because uh, in this scene, you see the money's all over the table. It's because the Monaghan boy finally, the horse threw the race. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they put a ton of money on the horse losing while the whole of London was betting on the horse uh, winning. Mm-hmm. And so here, Tom, uh, Polly's confronting him that, you know, essentially about Billy Kimber. Like you're, you're playing with fire here of what you're doing. And, um, I think Tommy's trying to limit the areas of which he has weaknesses. And one of them is Ada with Freddie. So I think it's partially that. And also partially that when you go down this route, it's like, you have to be selfish in a way, right? It's an ambitious, selfish Mm -hmm. route. Like it's all about you and your family and that's it. Yeah. And really sometimes you know, just you, because you have to do things that are going to require sacrifices and you're going to have to, it's like what he says to Campbell later. When I've achieved what I've set out to achieve, you know, and we're going to get there because it's, it's the next scene, Uh but, um, you can see he's a man on a mission. And right now, any reminder of the good person he used to be, as Paulie says here, like, what did the war do to you? Like she says, damn the war for what it did Mm -hmm. to you. You know, you could tell that he used to be somebody who probably was an optimist about life and not this kind of like cynical uh, realist, yeah. right? As he says here, he sees machine guns and rifles. He's talking about Freddy using the Shelbys and their power as a way to bring on a communist yeah, revolution. Yeah, so maybe it is all about the communist revolution, but I'm not I'm not sure. I, I think we might be missing some part of the story at this point. There's got to be some other... No, other, I, don't, I don't think that there's... Well, yeah, there might be more well, here. We know that that Freddy saved his life in the war. He took a bullet for him, right? So like, mm-hmm. it's got to be more than just the communist revolution. Something, something more than that, I would imagine. Yeah, I, my bet is it has more to do with like connections to his past. You know, there's a if you think about it, he's they he feels like a man. He's back from the war, and so he feels like he's on. Any time after this is like playing with house money at this point. Everyone has died, so it's like you're up. At this point, If as long as you live, it doesn't matter at this point because it's I should have been dead in the yeah. war. That's kind of probably like the mentality. And so in order to do the things that he's doing now, it's not even like from a perspective of greed necessarily. It's like probably more out of like a I can do it because I'm, I'm alive and I'm going to do yeah, it. Yeah, well, that, that's kind of, of what I was saying you know, earlier, like the whole what do I have to lose sort of thing. Like I should already be dead. So what if I die? You know, that's kind of the the vibe that I get from from them. We we had the scene where I, th- I think it was Polly who actually suggested the abortion. She's she was talking to Ada and she's like, "You're a whore. The baby's a bastard. And there's no name for the man that doesn't come back." And that, that yeah, was her she's, convincing she, argument. She's essentially she's essentially relating um, to Ada her own life story because mm-hmm. <clears throat> she tells her. 
that she had to perform an abortion on herself when she was 16. Mm -hmm. And um, she almost died. And uh, she says, essentially, she makes kind of like a social commentary here on, you know, the man gets away scot-free and gets away with it, but the woman is called a whore, the baby's called a bastard, and and your life is a misery Mm -hmm. after that. And so she's just trying to give her some motherly advice here on, you know, trying to save her future. But Ada really doesn't want to go through with it because she thinks that Freddie will make it right and marry him. Following that scene, we have the... The tea um, house. One of the more epic moments. You got the, the the tea house encounter between Campbell and Tommy Shelby. Interesting spot. This little like t- feminine but tea I house. I think for that's you guys. the point. It's out of their. Uh, Campbell says right? that he's like, I chose this place because it's out of both of our jurisdictions, and it's completely been out of great if he's like, too, for, for the both of us. It would have been great if he was like, I chose this place because the biscuits are just terrific. <laughs> <laughs> just absolutely. As uh, as weird looking as this, this, or as feminine as this place is, it's it's pretty. Well, it's, 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 pretty like, cool it's just looking, more like for, it's very it, it, no, it's really cool looking. It's just like frilly. The, everyone else at the tables, I think, were women. And there's like flowers. It's like oh, a tea yeah. party it does place. Look like a tea party. So you place. see these two, you see like a gang, a gang leader and the head of the Belfast <laughs> cops, and they're meeting up to talk about like stolen military mm-hmm. arms. So it's kind of like a funny uh, difference in location. Yeah. Here, here we have them negotiating, and um, Campbell brings up Ada. Essentially, everything here is kind of subtext threats, mm-hmm. right? From Campbell, and then Tommy just says, "Like, let's cut the bullshit." Here's the deal, okay? Because Campbell's trying to use the fact that Ada's in bed with co- with a communist yeah. um, to kind of like mm, use that as a, a negotiating tactic here. But um, Tommy's deal in return, this is kind of where we finally see to fruition, like Tommy's plan here. Mm-hmm. All right. He's what he why he's holding on to the guns, what he's going to use them for, what's it, what is his intent, and how does he plan to like use this as an opportunity to to advance in his status with the well, not in the world, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He tells Campbell that he has the weapons. He wants his special operatives to leave him alone. He doesn't want any more raids on his territory. No smashing up of his pubs. No more arresting his runners. Mm-hmm. And he wants a complete blind eye on all of his gambling operations. Mm-hmm. Okay. He's planning to expand on the racetracks. I'm literally reading it on the subtitles here. And he wants to do business with Billy Kimber. So he's literally just telling him the whole bet here. Yeah. He has um he wants a blind eye to the expansion of his business until he's achieved what he set out to achieve. And um when he makes his move and achieves his move. He tells Campbell, it's at that point that I will tell you where the guns are. And he also tells him that if he um, is taken into custody by the law enforcement, that he has trusted men who will send these weapons directly to Liverpool and they will send them and sell them to the IRA in Ireland who will use them. And it'll be the end of essentially Campbell's yeah. career. Tommy's essentially taking reading Campbell here as somebody who is power hungry, who wants to ascend the the ladder of rank or the, you know, mm-hmm. whatever ladder that he can climb. Yeah. Um, and he reads him correctly because Campbell keeps him at the table and agrees to the he deal. He does. I like how Campbell didn't have a pen. He's like, what do I, I can't write down this long list. And Tommy just pulls out a pen. Tommy pulls out a pen. Go. I like how Tommy, when he's leaving, picks up the pen. He's like, he doesn't even give him a pen. No. He leaves nothing at the yeah. table. He's, in, he's the guy who's going to wrap up the bread and take it home. Um... <laughs> So uh, at the end of this, Campbell has the audacity to kind of have like a, a rude remark and goes, you know, I prefer if we don't shake on it. Yeah. And Tommy gets the last word here where he essentially says, what makes you think I'd shake hands with someone who didn't even fight for their country? Yeah, exactly. And Tommy's really using they're, that as they're a, all if using you didn't that. fight for your country, <laughs> if you didn't fight for your country, you, if you, <laughs> you do not want to do business with Tommy Shelby. I'll no. tell you that. That yeah. is for sure. I wonder if Billy Kimber fought for his country. I don't know. I, I, don't think so. He doesn't. He doesn't seem like the front lines no. type, you know. All I right. kind of, I kind of got the sense that that Tommy was like a little out of his depth in this scene, though. Like, I, I, it looks like he, he put well, all of his cards on the table. You know, it was one vulnerable. of those that was, it was a very risky, risky play, mm-hmm. right? In my opinion, it's kind of like one of those show things, right? But Campbell does want to ascend the ladder here, and a lot of times, higher ups. 
they don't care about like the details of why something happened yeah. or why something went wrong. They don't care. They just want results. They want to know why and they want it fixed. They don't care about apologies. It's get it fixed. Mm-hmm. And so Campbell sees this like probably from that perspective of after the can- of the Churchill call, you know, that he needs to just get this thing done. And um, if it get if the weapons get to the IRA and they get there out of his ego being the issue, then it's going to be the end of his career mm-hmm. and his hopes to ascend the, the corporate ladder. Um, okay. Next scene. What do we have in the next scene here? We have... It's the opera house. Uh, the opera house scene full of metaphors. You got the... You got the lover on, on the stage who stabs her, her lover, and you have Campbell giving Grace the mission to get close to Tommy Shelby mm-hmm. to find out where the guns mm-hmm. are. How does that? How does that go come and come up in combo? I'm assuming she has to sleep with him. Yeah, and well. she's got to just be like, "So where are those guns?" <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to know how that's supposed to. Um, it's not yeah, going to come like, from conversation. There's no way. You'd have to overhear no. it because you're just continuously hey, close to him. So or guns? Sleeps. You got any? Where are they? Yeah, he gives her a gun as well. Campbell clearly has like the hots for oh, Grace that's here. For sure. He grabs her at the end. He's like, "My heart goes with you. My heart is with you." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the dark turn for Campbell here in the opera house doing business. Yeah. Here. The guy on stage gets stabbed get- to death. Now it's great. Meanwhile, Tommy's having uh, nightmares and is awoken by a, a frantic Curly who... Uh, Curly, you can never understand anything coming no, out of his mouth. Can't. It's like uh, he he's having a frantic... He's always know, having an episode. Because he's... I mean, he's a gypsy and he's very superstitious, so... Yeah. Well, you they know, all you're are. like, what's wrong with the horse? They're all extremely Well, Tommy secretly is too, right? Because he... You know, upon, all right, so let me break it down here for the audience. The horse has some sort of disease. Curly saying that the Lees put a curse on it because Tommy bought the horse in bad spirit. Mm-hmm. Essentially, Tommy beat the crap out of him, you know, and, and took the horse. Yeah. So uh, they put a bad seed in the hoof. He said, anyways, Curly saying the spell can't be undone. It's it's broken. The curse is there. <laughs> and t- and Tommy's buying a hook, line, mm-hmm. and sinker. I mean, part of me think- is thinking Tommy might be a little bit high from the opium here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, right, I mean, he, he, was, he smoking was smoking in the previous earlier. scene. And he's, like, holding his head so he can't imagine what's going on. Charlie's into it, too. So all three of them are, like, these gypsy, like, they believe all this yeah. stuff from the black blood gypsies. And they, uh, you know, I I mean, it goes from zero to 100 real quick. Like, he, within, like, 45 seconds in the barn, he puts a bullet in the horse's mm-hmm. head. So I would, you know, Zach, do some research on black blood gypsies and curses and find out uh and then clear your google search history <laughs> unless you're beat at for for the risk that your apartment may become haunted uh after the fact <laughs> i don't know anything about that i do believe in the supernatural uh, uh, but this uh <laughs> it says true romany gypsies were regarded as being of the pure black blood and the word black was regularly used as a compliment particularly in people's names, meaning gypsy of the purest type. Interesting. In the next scene, uh, Grace actually sings for Tommy, and, and in the lyrics there's a black band is mentioned, and I wonder if that has something to do, because none of these like singing moments go without like some sort of meaning in them. Yeah. And the lyrics very much are like reminiscent of Tommy's life that we know of. Is, you know? It, is it just me, or do I find like these singing moments like extremely freaking awkward like i think any moment like any singing that's like acapella like that right is gonna be a little awkward but you know it's i find it more this one i didn't take awkward the one i found awkward is when she's getting hired Mm -hmm. and she just starts singing that one i found a little awkward uh this one not so much i just find it really weird you know it's like in front of somebody and start singing yeah, but he, they, you know, he asked her to do it, and anyways, we're get, we're skipping ahead here. This is probably the most iconic scene of the whole series, uh, in my opinion. It's the the Grace and Tommy love story kind of is kicks off for real mm-hmm. here. You know, you get a, a Grace who consoles Tommy, who during a, a time where he's more distraught about this horse than 
the other stuff going on in his life at this mm-hmm. moment. Um, and she, they essentially just uh, talk here, and you know, he guesses that she's a, a good girl who got pregnant. He doesn't buy the whole Dublin that she worked in Dublin nonsense, right? Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things where he, she rides with his prediction of who she is and why she's in Birmingham. And she uses that as her front. So the song that she sings is called um, The Black Velvet Band. Uh, and the, the uh, Dubliners did a, a cover of it, um, what, in like uh, 67. But apparently it's a traditional folk song collected from singers in Ireland, Australia, England, Canada, and the United States describing how a young man is tricked and then sentenced to transportation to Australia, a common punishment in the British Empire during the 19th century. Hmm. Tommy here makes a comment that reminds me of this movie called Fury, where he says in... In France, I got used to seeing men die. I didn't get used to seeing horses die. He talks about how mm. horses die badly. Mm. And there's a scene in Fury where Brad Pitt's character, uh, they're like, his his men, like his troop, are essentially like baiting him into getting angry <laughs> and bringing up the story of the horses that they found massacred on the battlefield. And, um, you know, th- this is a... This is the scene where you actually have Tommy open up to somebody for the first time, and you get like a sense of like the, like the the mystery of Tommy Shelby mm-hmm. of of being this person who doesn't confide in anybody who, uh, you know, he he definitely sees something in Grace because he's talking to her more than he's talked to anybody in any any of the episodes, yeah. right? And he's also using her and his prediction of her as being like the good girl who got pregnant from a good family and left as his justification for his approach with Ada mm-hmm. in some ways. Um, one of the things I didn't fully pick up on. But you have the, yes, the iconic scene where he asked her to get up on the chair and dance, and he puts dance, her, he, she puts him to sleep. <laughs> oh, yeah, sing, my bad. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, and <laughs> imagine she just said, he says, dance for yeah. me. Uh, <laughs> remix it. And uh, she puts him to sleep. It's almost like somebody who can fully comfort this troubled uh human yeah. being because he was having nightmares before this scene he's having nightmares smoking mm-hmm. opium and he's in a tunnel and he's getting like this ptsd so this is like a, a scene that shows the f- the future of these i two. feel like this guy has a nightmare every night like i i, I that's the way they make a scene every time they've shown him sleeping every time they show him sleeping in the show he has a nightmare um the following day you get a final you get a little bright note in this episode Freddie meets Ada at the train station that she's leaving. She's actually going to leave the 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 city. I believe she was going to go get an abortion somewhere else, right? Yeah, that was, and, that was what um, she was thinking at least. Yeah, and Tommy tips tips off Freddie Thorne. So even Tommy kind of surprised the whole audience here because I thought he was going to do the Same. opposite. He tips off Freddie Thorne, but he tells him also to leave. He doesn't tell him to stay. Yeah. And uh, Freddie decides that he's going to propose, but he's also not going to leave because uh, he's not – "Quote unquote," scared of Tommy Shelby, although he's been hiding from his ass. Well, he just the entire he just season said in the so last far. episode that he is afraid of the Shelby. Is scared. Yeah, I'm not scared of Tommy Shelby, <laughs> but you know what? He really doesn't have anything to be afraid of. Tommy's not going to kill this guy. I mean, you know, I can't see it happening. Is this my bet? I know what happens, but do I get a bottle of whiskey if I'm right? It, well, if you're right about what? Nothing. Nothing. Forget it. I'm not uh-huh. gonna... We gotta have some sort of way. Yeah, here, but we've know? already seen it, so we, it has to be on the, it has to be on the <laughs> last season, and we cannot watch it ahead of time. We have to watch it one episode at a time. All right, all right, <laughs> all right. Back to the bar. We get the introduction to Billy Kimber. This is the culmination of the episode. This is finally where we see where Tommy's mind at. How all of these converging conflicts are coming into some master criminal plan by Tommy Shelby. And you get the epic intro to Billy Kimber himself, who's a kind of an underwhelming character because mm-hmm. he's not like a very impressive man. You no, know what I mean? He's like he's, not. You can see he's kind of like, um, he, what do you call that when somebody's petty? Like he's just petty. a... <laughs> a bitch. <laughs> yeah, there's, an, a, there's another word for it. But you can tell he's kind of like this insecure guy who's like, 
screaming and all that sort of thing. I like... Uh, they clear the... Uh, I was going to say that this guy only looks strong because of his army that he always has with him. But I, I like how... Uh, did you pick up on the whole, oh, no whiskey, Tom? You were expecting trouble? Really? Yeah, yeah, he was expecting he was expecting Billy Kimber to come, yeah, right? So I guess I guess we don't drink strong alcohol when we're expecting trouble in this. Yeah, I'm gonna only drink beer during these podcasts because I always <laughs> expect trouble. Yeah, so you get this sit down here with Kimber, his accountant, and John, Tom, and Arthur, and um, you get the sense here that there's a couple things going on. I'd say Kimber's kind of like Arthur in a way, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? He's kind of a combo of Arthur and John, and the accountant's yeah. truly the guy in charge for Kimber, while Tommy's the guy in charge for the Peaky Blinders. But you still see there's a power dynamic here where Tommy doesn't want to call himself the leader of the Peaky Blinders. It's still so early on, and it's not fully acknowledged yet by the other two brothers mm. that Tommy's actually the leader of this pack, yeah. right? So you get the intro here, and you find out that Kimber's pissed about Monaghan Boy mm-hmm. and the in the race but you can see that tommy used the throne race as a way to get kimber's attention as a to get a foot in the door and he provoked the lees into a war because kimber has an issue with the mm-hmm. lees um pretty much attacking his men at the racetracks so tommy's using the the war with the lees as his negotiating leverage with kimber the accountant sees the value of this and then he's also um he also used the horse in order to get in the door in the first place and the guns i guess are essentially a way to just have the government you know give a blind eye to the type of moves he's trying to make Mm -hmm. here right i mean it seems like that's Um, what he's trying to use as leverage at this point at the mo at the moment i feel like it could probably be used for more than that you Mm -hmm. know but um but we're not quite there yet so you have this truly immature moment where Kimber throws a coin on the floor and Tommy uh, tries to make a good impression here. Tommy's actually like, look, I respect you. Yeah. You can see almost like Tommy he admires him. Tommy's almost kind of, he's Tommy's kind of like meeting a, maybe I'm full of crap and this is not the case, but I actually think that he kind of genuinely had respect for him. He built up, Kimber built this up from nothing. You know, he's trying to do the same thing for himself. He's trying to convey this to him, mm-hmm. but Kimber's not having, he's like, people don't work with me. They work for me. And he throws a coin on the ground and yeah. needs to see him pick it up. It's a power. Of course. T- typical power move. But um, We have a John boy over here. <laughs> His hot yeah, head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's a hot head. That's a all it is. He's a <clears throat> yeah, I actually can't even imagine a, um, a reality where Kimber's actually the guy who built up that business. To me, it's he's talking to Kimber, but in reality, he's talking to the accountant. Yeah, the accountant really seems like the one in charge of this whole thing. Uh, yeah, Billy Kimber agreed. just seems like the name and the muscle. Not that he's strong, but he has guys. Yeah, he's just the name. He's the name of the operation, but the accountant's the guy in charge here. What is Pikey? He says, "Pick it up, Pikey." Is that? I think Pike Pikey's an yeah, insult. But, it's got to be an uh, insult. I'm, I'm, let's see. You can see here. All right, so like in some in some shows, like there's always moments in the, in shows like this where. You have a moment where somebody's manhood is challenged in a way, and throwing a coin on the floor and telling another man to pick it up is a is a direct insult to someone's like manhood and pride, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and you always wonder if these larger than life characters like are they going to pick it up? You know, would Clint Eastwood have picked up that uh, coin? Clint Eastwood would have blown his head off, <laughs> right? Exactly. But but you also see here this is like a different type of character it's different. in a way. He's he's able to he's able to take kind of eat dirt in the short term because he has a long-term play Mm -hmm. to me like billy kimber cemented his fate with the coin toss there but you know tommy shelby's coming for everything i mean and so at the end of the episode he tells his brothers we're going to the races boys and um that concludes episode two brings it to a head of peaky blinders so apparently pikey is a slang Mm -hmm. term which is pejorative and considered by many to be a slur It is used mainly in the UK to refer to people who are of the traveler community, a set of ethno-cultural groups found primarily in Great Britain and Ireland. So the gypsies. Pretty much. Basically. I'm assuming because they they make a lot of... uh, They are the traveler community, right? Yeah. Altogether, 
this episode really like if you're not all in after this episode peaky's not going to get you in because all of the conflict has come to to the head you get a little bit of everything in this episode not to a head but you see the bubbling of it now you need to see the resolution of how tommy's going to get out of this you know yeah Think oh, about well, it. he has the thing I'm, with I'm Campbell. I'm thinking about the, uh, the, the brown bread or the white bread. <laughs> no, yeah, but we I, haven't gotten that I far. Know. But this is just like a matter of, of hooking people nice, in. But that's another one. For me, and, for me it's that because what we, what we find then, I don't know. I, I, I like it. I, I think that was, you know, just another really strong <clears throat> moment. Agreed. Without agreed. trying to, to Any, say anything that is spoilery. So I'm stepping on any my own closing, way. any closing thoughts on the episode before we wrap up this? this yeah, I mean, I was gonna say, you know, best scene. You know, what, what do you think that yours is? Right. I gotta, I gotta go with the Grace and Tommy scene. That's one of my favorite scenes in the entire uh, series. So, so at first, I, I had written down the, the Tommy and Campbell meeting at the tea house because it was just, it was very suspenseful, um, but it was very interesting. There, there's just so much happening there. Like you said, there's a lot in the subtext. Um, but then we got this scene here with, with Billy Kimber. It's just, you know, everything, everything coming into fruition that, that we've seen in, in the last episode and this episode. So I think I'd have to give it to that scene. Just the introduction yeah, of that I'm, character. My runner up was the Campbell, uh, scene for, just, I mean, to the, and as a runner up to the gray scene, but I do, I enjoy the gray scene the most in the bar because it's you know it's it's just iconic um all right so the next episode we have them going to the cheltenham races and we see what continues that is for sure see what happens and continues on this journey zach you want to close this out absolutely well thank you for listening to story archives peaky blinders edition you can find Story Archives on the web at storyarchives.themidnightexchange.com. You can find us on Instagram at Story Archives. Uh, and you can also find our um, you know, podcast network, The Midnight Exchange, at themidnightexchange.com. And you can find uh, you know, that podcast anywhere that you have podcasts as well. Uh, we're also on Instagram at The Midnight Exchange, Facebook at The Midnight Exchange, and Twitter at T-H-E-M-E Podcast. And uh, we also have a Lupin uh, series for the Story Archives podcast here. If you want to go take a listen to that, that one's that one's all up to date. It's uh, is done unless unless they come back with another season, then we'll we'll have to jump back on that train. But mm-hmm. at this point, it's all up to date. So, alrighty, thank you for tuning in, and until next time, thank you for joining us on the Peaky Pod by Story Archives. Mm-hmm.